Have you ever wondered how a small bakery could ignite a fire that devastated an entire city? Welcome to our journey through the Great Fire of London. It all began on Pudding Lane, in the heart of the city. A tiny spark, born in the oven of a local bakery, soon fanned into a ferocious flame. The weather, dry and windy, played accomplice to this fiery monster, helping it spread quickly and mercilessly. London, at this time, was a maze of narrow lanes lined with wooden structures. These structures, dry and parched, were the perfect fuel for the fire, aiding its rapid and ruthless spread. The city, once bustling with life, was soon engulfed in a sea of flames. The fire showed no mercy, consuming everything in its path. As we delve into the details, you'll find out how a seemingly innocent spark unleashed a fiery beast upon the city. Imagine a city in chaos, people fleeing their homes as a monstrous inferno rages in the background. That was the reality during the Great Fire of London. As the flames spread, Londoners were forced to make desperate attempts to escape the encroaching firestorm. Some tried to fight the blaze, forming bucket lines from the Thames, but the fire was relentless. It devoured everything in its path, pushed by a strong east wind. The death toll, surprisingly, was reported to be low. But this number may not account for the countless unrecorded deaths among the city's poorest. Samuel Pepys, a naval administrator and renowned diarist, provides an intimate account of this disaster. He writes of the horrid, malicious, bloody flame and the panic of the people. His diary serves as a poignant reminder of the human cost of the fire. Despite their best efforts, the citizens of London were unable to quell the raging fire, leading to a catastrophic aftermath. You might be wondering, how did this colossal fire finally meet its end? Well, the answer lies in a combination of human effort and Mother Nature's intervention. The turning point arrived on the fourth day, as the wind, which had been fanning the flames, finally subsided. Meanwhile, firefighters, using primitive fire engines, were desperately trying to create fire breaks by pulling down houses with hooks and using gunpowder to demolish buildings in the fire's path. Their efforts were bolstered by the Duke of York's men, who brought a semblance of order to the chaotic scene. King Charles II himself was seen passing buckets of water to combat the flames. But it was a change in the wind direction and the onset of light rain that finally helped douse the flames. Londoners breathed a sigh of relief as the last embers flickered out, marking the end of four devastating days. The fire's end, however, was not the end of London's ordeal. It was merely the beginning of a new chapter. The Great Fire had ceased, but it left behind a city in ruins. The once bustling streets of London were now a ghost town, its buildings reduced to ashes. The fire did not discriminate, it claimed homes of both the rich and the poor. Thousands were left homeless, their livelihoods up in smoke. The city's infrastructure took a severe hit. Iconic structures like St. Paul's Cathedral stood no more, their grandeur devoured by the flames. The fire's wrath spared very little, leaving a trail of devastation in its wake. The human cost was equally staggering. While the official death toll was surprisingly low, the fire's true casualty was the way of life for countless Londoners. It robbed them of their homes, their livelihoods, and a sense of security. Yet amid the ashes and rubble, the spirit of London remained unbroken. Like a phoenix rising from the ashes, London was not destined to remain in ruins. The Great Fire of London in its destructive wake left the city with an opportunity for transformation. The rebuilding process wasn't swift, but it was thorough and it was all-encompassing. The city's leadership, well aware of the factors that had allowed the fire to spread so rampantly, made significant changes to prevent a repeat of such a disaster. The new city would not be the wood and straw tinderbox of old. Instead, brick and stone became the materials of choice, better able to resist the ravages of fire. Streets were widened and straightened, creating more space between buildings and reducing the likelihood of fire spreading from one to the next. The rebuilding of London Act of 1667 played a crucial role in this transformation. It established regulations for the construction of buildings and the layout of streets. This act was an early example of city planning, a concept that we take for granted today but was quite revolutionary at the time. London's iconic skyline began to take shape during this period. Monumental structures like St. Paul's Cathedral and the Monument to the Great Fire of London, both designed by Sir Christopher Wren, rose from the ashes of the old city. These structures are not just architectural marvels, but symbols of London's resilience and rebirth. Comparing maps of London before and after the fire reveals a city transformed. 
The narrow, winding streets of medieval London gave way to a more orderly and spacious layout. The new design prioritized functionality and safety over tradition, a tangible marker of progress. The Great Fire of London was a catastrophe of unprecedented scale, but it also served as a catalyst for change. It forced the city to adapt, to innovate, and to rebuild stronger than before. This is the spirit of London, a city that refuses to be defined by its disasters, but instead uses them as opportunities for growth. The Great Fire of London, a disaster that led to a rebirth, forever changing the face of one of the world's most iconic cities.